The most popular argument for Islam today is what I call the argument from rapid growth. Islam is the world's fastest growing religion, so it must be true. In a separate video, I went through some statistics to show why Islam is growing rapidly, and the reasons have nothing to do with Islam being true. Islam is growing rapidly primarily due to high birth rates among Muslims. Muslims have higher birth rates than other groups because of Muhammad's impact on women. Islam provides few opportunities in life for women, so they're married off at a younger age and tend to have more children. If you haven't seen the video yet and you'd like to watch the full discussion, the link is in the description box. But there's a variation of the argument that focuses not on Islam's growth in the world today, but on Islam's early growth. It goes like this. During the time of Muhammad and his followers, Islam spread rapidly in Arabia. It spread so rapidly that God must have been helping the Muslim community. So Islam must be the true religion. This is obviously a silly argument since many other religions and ideologies and groups spread rapidly. But the argument does give us a perfect opportunity to consider why Islam spread rapidly during the time of Muhammad and his companions and to compare the spread of Islam with the spread of Christianity, which also grew rapidly, but for very different reasons. When we read the Muslim sources, we see people converting to Islam for a variety of reasons. Let's look at four of these reasons. Historically, we know that some individuals were so impressed by Islam's ability to inspire men to kill without question that they converted to Islam. In Ibn Asaq Surat Rasulullah, page 369, we read, The apostle said, Kill any Jew that falls into your power. Thereupon Mu'ayisa bin Masud leapt upon Ibn Sunayna, a Jewish merchant with whom they had social and business relations, and killed him. Hu'ayisa was not a Muslim at the time, though he was the elder brother. When Mu'ayisa killed him, Hu'ayisa began to beat him, saying, You enemy of God, did you kill him when much of the fat on your belly comes from his wealth? Mu'ayisa answered, Had the one who ordered me to kill him ordered me to kill you, I would have cut your head off. He said that this was the beginning of Hu'ayisa's acceptance of Islam. The other replied, by God, if Muhammad had ordered you to kill me, would you have killed me? He said, Yes, by God, had he ordered me to cut off your head, I would have done so. He exclaimed, By God, a religion which can bring you to this is marvelous. And he became a Muslim. In this passage, Muhammad tells his followers to kill any Jew that falls into your power. A Muslim, acting on Muhammad's orders, kills a Jewish merchant. The Muslim's brother doesn't understand how his brother could turn against a friend of the family so quickly. The Muslim's response is that if Muhammad commanded it, he would murder anyone, even his own family. And the brother is so impressed by this willingness to mindlessly kill for Muhammad, he converts to Islam. We find another example on page 676, where Muhammad has one of his followers murder a woman named Asma bint Marwan for writing a poem challenging people to stand up to Muhammad. Ibn Asak reports, the day after Bint Marwan was killed, the men of Bani Katma became Muslims because they saw the power of Islam. Muhammad's followers stabbed a woman to death. What an amazing religion! This sounds odd to us, but in 7th century Arabia, becoming extremely passionate about something, to the point of being willing to kill for it, was evidence of its truth. After all, why would you be willing to kill for something unless you were absolutely certain that it was true? So people actually converted to Islam because they were impressed by its ability to turn people into killing machines. Many people were impressed when Muhammad spoke. He preached as if he knew what he was talking about, and he confidently answered difficult questions that no one else could answer. The problem is that many of his answers were completely false. Consider the answers given by Muhammad in Sahih al-Bukhari 3329. Narrated Anas, when Abdullah bin Salam heard of the arrival of the Prophet at al Madina, he came to him and said, I am going to ask you about three things which nobody knows except a Prophet. One, what is the first portent of the hour, the sign of the end times? Two, what will be the first meal taken by the people of paradise? Three, 
Why does a child resemble its father, and why does it resemble its maternal uncle, its mother's brother? Allah's Messenger said, Jibreel, Gabriel, has just now told me of their answers. Notice that Muhammad is getting these answers from Gabriel, the same Gabriel that was giving him the Quran. Abdullah said, He, i.e. Jibreel, from amongst all the angels is the enemy of the Jews. Allah's Messenger said, As for the first sign of the hour, it will be a fire that will collect or gather the people from the east to the west. The first meal of the people of paradise will be extra lobe, caudate lobe, of fish liver. As for the resemblance of the child to its parents, if a man has sexual intercourse with his wife and gets discharged first, the child will resemble the father, and if the woman gets discharged first, the child will resemble her. On that, Abdullah bin Salam said, I testify that you are the messenger of Allah. Here Muhammad is presented with three questions. What's the sign that the end is coming? What will the first meal in heaven be? And how come a child sometimes looks like its father's side of the family, but other times resembles its mother's side of the family? Notice that Muhammad's answers to the first two questions, a great fire in the end times and fish liver in heaven, can't be tested. There's no way to know if they're true or false until judgment day. Muhammad could have just as easily claimed that the portent of the hour will be that three frogs will recite the Quran and that the first meal in heaven will be peanut butter and hummus sandwiches. In other words, we have no reason to think that Muhammad's answers are correct because we have no way to test their accuracy. But Muhammad's third answer is testable because today anyone who pays attention in biology class knows why children sometimes resemble their father and sometimes resemble their mother. And Muhammad's answer is utter nonsense. Women don't have a discharge that contributes to the appearance of the offspring. They have an egg, but this isn't a discharge. We also know that a child's appearance has nothing to do with which parent has the first discharge. So Muhammad's just wrong. But notice that people converted when Muhammad gave answers like this. If you asked most people these kinds of questions, they'd answer, how would I know? But Muhammad would give answers, and he would be so confident that people would think that he really knew what he was talking about, even though he had no clue what he was talking about. Muhammad made an enticing guarantee to those who waged jihad for him. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2787, Muhammad says, The example of a mujahid, a jihadi, in Allah's cause, and Allah knows better who really strives in his cause, is like a person who observes saum, fasting, and offers salat, prayer, continuously. Allah guarantees that he will admit the mujahid in his cause into paradise if he is killed, otherwise he will return him to his home safely, with rewards and war booty. If a 7th century pagan Arab rejected Islam, he was guaranteed nothing. He may be poor all his life, and he wouldn't know what would happen to him when he died. But Muhammad guaranteed that if a person dies fighting Islam's enemies, he will enter paradise and get his virgins, and that even if he survives, he will return home safely with rewards and war booty. The rewards and war booty included sex slaves. Either way, whether they lived or died, pagans had quite a bit to gain if they became Muslims. Muhammad's promise of rewards and war booty was an important factor in the early spread of Islam. In fact, using promises of money and sex slaves to win converts was part of Muhammad's strategy. For example, when Muhammad was accused of distributing the spoils of war unevenly, he replied, are you disturbed in mind because of the good things of this life by which I win over a people that they may become Muslims while I entrust you to your Islam? In Sahih al-Bukhari 3344, Muhammad divides a piece of gold among four chiefs of a different tribe. We read, So the Quraysh and the Ansar became angry and said, He, i.e. the Prophet, gives to the chiefs of Najd and does not give to us. The Prophet said, I give to them so as to attract their hearts to Islam. So, for the early Muslims, the importance of money and captives as a motive for conversion can hardly be overstated. Many early converts embraced Islam not out of any desire to worship Allah, but out of a desire for treasure and sex slaves. And Muhammad encouraged such conversions.
One of Islam's greatest sources of new converts, of course, was intimidation. History shows that people were directly threatened with death in the presence of Muhammad if they refused to become Muslims. We read in Ibn Asak, page 547, Muhammad said, Woe to you, Abu Sufyan! Isn't it time that you recognize that I am God's apostle? He answered, As to that, I still have some doubt. I said to him, Submit and testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the apostle of God before you lose your head. So he did so. Abu Sufyan doubted the prophethood of Muhammad, yet he was told to convert before he lost his head. Fully aware of the countless people that had been murdered by Muhammad, Abu Sufyan submitted to Islam. But don't take my word on the importance of threats and intimidation in early Islam. Let's read Abu Bakr's summary of Muhammad's life and work. In the History of At-Tabari, volume 10, page 55, Abu Bakr declares, Verily God, may he be exalted, sent Muhammad with his truth to his creation as a bearer of good tidings and as a warner and as one calling others to God with his permission and as a light bringing lamp so that he might warn all who live and so that the saying against the unbelievers might be fulfilled. So God guided with the truth whoever responded to him and the apostle of God with his permission struck whoever turned his back to him until he came to Islam willingly or grudgingly. Fear of death, it seems, played a crucial role in converting people to Islam. So we've looked at several reasons for the rapid spread of Islam. Muhammad's ability to inspire rage and violence, Muhammad's false revelations and people's ignorance, Muhammad's promises of captives and war booty, and violent intimidation. Is there anything miraculous here? If there is, I must be missing it. Let's compare the early spread of Islam with the early spread of Christianity. The first generation of Christians went out preaching that Jesus had died on the cross and rose from the dead. Jesus' death by crucifixion was a public event. There was no disputing that. And more than 500 Christians were claiming that they had seen him alive again after his death. So they proclaimed Jesus' resurrection. There was only one problem. Many Jewish leaders, and eventually the entire Roman Empire, wanted to silence them. Think about this. In one corner, there's a small group of Christians who had no political power and wouldn't return violence for violence. They wouldn't fight. In the other corner, there's the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. What chance did the Christians have? From a worldly point of view, none. Fortunately for Christians, there are more powerful forces at work in our world than empires. In the Old Testament, God ordained some important festivals for the Jews. Two of the most important festivals were the Passover festival and the Festival of Weeks, or Pentecost. Jews would travel to Jerusalem for their major festivals. As time went on, many nations conquered the Jews. Some of these nations would take Jews to different parts of their empire. But because of the Jewish laws, Jews generally wouldn't intermingle with people from other nations, so they were able to retain their identity as Jews. Eventually, there were groups of Jews around the Middle East, across Northern Africa, and in Europe. Many of these Jews would return to Jerusalem for the major feasts if they were able. Jesus was crucified when the Jews had gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Two to three million Jews would have been in Jerusalem at the time, and many of them would have heard about Jesus being crucified since he had caused quite a stir. A few days later, some of these Jews would have even heard rumors that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then they would have gone back to their homes in Arabia, Egypt, Rome, and all sorts of other places. Seven weeks after Jesus' death by crucifixion, there was the Festival of Weeks, Pentecost. Jerusalem would have again been filled with Jews traveling to be with their brothers and sisters. That's when the Holy Spirit fell on more than a hundred of the original Christians. Suddenly, they were able to speak in the languages of Jews from three different continents. As we read in the opening verses of Acts chapter 2, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. The Apostle Peter preached a sermon, and around 3,000 Jews became Christians. But this time, when the feast was over, these Jewish believers didn't go home. They stayed with the apostles to learn about Jesus Christ from his disciples. This is one of the main reasons we read about Christians selling their property to fund the early church. There were people who had come from other countries to celebrate a festival, but they ended up staying with the disciples. So Christians who had property would sell it to support this international Christian community living in Jerusalem. Eventually, after the stoning of a Christian named Stephen, a massive persecution broke out against the Christians living in Jerusalem, which included Christians from three different continents. It was then that these people who had come from all over the Roman Empire and from other places left Jerusalem and went back to their homes, fully equipped to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. By that time, it was too late for the Romans or anyone else to stop Christianity. There were already thousands of Christians spread across three continents preaching the gospel in their native language, and many of these Christians had learned about Jesus from his original followers. So why did Christianity expand so rapidly? Christianity spread because it was grounded in a miracle that people could examine and verify, and that instantly set it apart from other religions, but this is only part of the story, because the expansion was hastened due to an amazing series of events. Jewish festivals, the victories of various nations over the Jews, Old Testament laws that kept the Jews from intermingling with other groups, Jesus' death and resurrection when Jews were gathered for Passover, the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit when Jews were gathered for Pentecost, and the persecution of Christians, sending them back to their own countries, all worked together for the spread of the gospel. So Christianity spread because of miracles amplified by a miraculous series of events. It spread so far, so fast, that it conquered the most powerful empire the world had ever seen without killing anyone. Islam, by contrast, spread because of lust, greed, fear, violence, and ignorance. You tell me which one came from God.